Okay, Tommy Emmanuel, welcome back. Thank you. To Australian <laughs> thank Musician. You. Oh, thank you, and hello, Australian musicians everywhere. Uh, it's a very special day, actually, because we're here yeah. at Soundcheck uh, for Maiton's 70th birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Maiton. 70 years, can you believe it? This is my, my first Maiton guitar right here. There's a little bit of history there. There is. This guitar, my father bought it for himself because uh, he fancied that he, he might take up the guitar. And... Um, so he used to just sit it on his lap and play it like that. He didn't have a clue how to play a chord or whatever. But uh, by that time, I was already playing. I had a little cheap guitar. And, uh, but I was forbidden to touch this guitar because yeah. it was expensive, you know. And so uh, he left it under the bed. And uh, during the day when he was at work, I would, I would come home from school I was at kindergarten, come home, and I'd take this guitar out and play it because it was nice to play. And um, he came home one, early one day and caught me playing it. And I thought I was going to get a, a thrashing. Yeah. And he said, can you play that? And I said, yeah. And I played a few chords for him. Yeah. And my mum sang a few bars of uh, Little Green Valley by Marty Robbins. Mm. And uh, he said, all right, it's yours. <laughs> and gave it to me. And, and then, so, of course, he had to buy your brother one. Exactly. Phil had to have one the same. Yeah. And uh, there's a little plate on it right here, which my father uh, had made. And it says, Tom Emmanuel, 1 Lawson Avenue, Gunnedah. Yeah. So that's where we lived. Yeah. Right across the road from the school. Yeah. And that now resides at the Maiton factory. Yeah, it's in the museum where probably they'll end up stuffing me and mounting me and <laughs> putting me in there as well. Thanks to Farlap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, um, yeah. Most of my guitars that, that we started out with where Maiton were um, experimenting and trying new instruments and trying to build better guitars, you know, I'd take them on the road and things, and then eventually I'd hand them back and then get a new one. Mm. Um, everybody knows your association with Maiton, but mm -hmm. Bill Maiton, uh, or Bill, Bill May. Bill May, uh, yeah. Did you have much to do with Bill? No, I met him one time, a uh, long, long time ago. He was very quiet spoken, but an incredibly enthusiastic man, um, beautiful person. And um, I think he just, he started out as a, he, as a resourceful kind of guy. He didn't have a guitar, mm. so he made one, you know. He, he loved working with wood. Uh, he built furniture as well, so he, he kind of knew what he was doing, you know. And... Um, and it just started from that, you know. And then um, I think in the late 50s, they started building more sophisticated instruments, jazz guitars, F-hole guitars. Um, he was making flat tops, and then eventually he got to solid body guitars. And, and I, I think he, his business took off, and, and um, uh, a lot of people discovered them, you know. Yeah. I mean... There's a lot of competition out there, and especially in the 60s, uh, there was Gretsch and Fender and Gibson who were really starting to, to rise, you know. I don't remember seeing a Martin guitar in Australia until about the mid-60s, you know. Uh, uh, I think Lionel Long might have been the first person I saw with a Martin guitar, okay. and then Chad Morgan, you know. <laughs> and uh, I worked with Buddy Williams, and Buddy played mostly played Gibsons. And, um, but I think everybody in the early days, everybody wanted to be like Jimmy Rogers. Mm. And Jimmy Rogers played a Martin. So yeah. I think most people wanted to be like that, yeah. you know. There was a time where you had a room at uh, Ron Lee's music factory. Yeah, exactly, in, in yeah. Melbourne, and yeah he used to be in Hyatt. Yeah, you were yeah, writing on. the Determination album? Exactly. Um, I had uh, I'd recorded up from Down Under and Dare to Be Different. And I'd written the songs in Sydney when I lived in Sydney. And then in 1990, I moved to Melbourne. And it was right after, uh, it was right after the tour that I did with uh, Albert Lee. And then I did a tour with Eric Clapton. Yep. And I came to Melbourne fired up, like inspired, because I'd been on the road with those guys. Mm. And, and what, being around Albert fired me up and got me playing a lot more, you know, um, n not quite so reserved. And then watching Eric play every night gave me ideas. And I, I saw that, that 
you know, I, I was only just uh, touching the surface of what was possible. So they were important guys to be around in those days. So when I got to Melbourne, um, I was convinced to move to Melbourne by Ron and Paula Gorman, uh, who wanted to manage me, and that was a wonderful move. Um, and um, so we were renting a little place there, and I used to uh, write uh, on a four-track cassette. Right? Yeah. It was a little uh, Fostex uh, four-track cassette. So I wrote pretty much the whole De Determination album in that back room. Mm. Um, and I would put down chords, and then I would write melody over the top of it. And that's how I wrote Determination, which was a 12-bar blues in D with every chord uh, suspended. That's where that idea of that song came from. If you listen to the song Determination, um, it's D 7th with a suspended 4, G 7th with a suspended 4. I just wanted to write a blues that didn't sound like any blues you ever heard before. Yeah. And so every chord was a suspended. Yeah. Um, and I wrote tunes like um, Who Dares Wins, uh, Mountain of Truth, and uh, you know, songs that, uh, that made that album what it was. Yeah. And, and uh, so Ron was gracious enough to let me you know, occupy one of those teaching rooms. And I just, it was like the salt mines. I just turned up every day, mm -hmm. went in there and said, I gotta come out with something every day, you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, a lot of people buy their gear uh, online these days. No. But how important were music stores to you growing up? Music stores were so important because they weren't just a place where you could go and buy a guitar or a set of strings or whatever, blah, blah. blah. It's where we used to meet up and sit and jam and play and talk and drink coffee and, you know. Mm. We, my brother and I, especially when we lived in Sydney, uh, there was a music store there called Gaslight Music run by my friend Daryl Miller. And I think I spent more time in the music store than I spent at home because it was so friendly and yeah. so welcoming, you know? And um, so music stores were very important. Plus, usually, I mean, guys like Ron Lee and, uh, you know, they sit and talk with people and help people. They were, they were real helpful people, you know? And, uh, mm -hmm. and gave good advice to parents who wanted their kids to have a their first guitar and all that sort of thing. They're, they're all decisions that, that you know, shape a person's life. Yeah. And so that, people who have a music store in those days had more responsibility than just being a retailer. Mm. They had to be an advisor as well and a, and a, and a psychologist yeah. somehow, you know. Yeah. You've uh, been a, a teacher basically all your life as well. Well, I've been trying, yeah. Growing up, what were the, the light bulb moments that you that took you sort of to the next level? I think there were several of those light bulb moments. First of all, just the fact that we were in show business was so exciting, you know. And and uh, doing TV and doing radio and feeling that sense of, of this is important, this is a good thing, and, and uh, it's entertaining people was exciting. And then the encouragement of people who saw you play and were like, wow, these kids can really play. It wasn't just like a novelty of being a kid. We could really play. And uh, I mean, it, it was, of course, still in its infancy and so were we. But, but we were serious about it and we, we, we loved our music and we loved to play and we loved performing. So, and, and really that hasn't changed, you know, yeah. but, um, uh, seeing, uh, watching comedians and watching singers and entertainers, people who were good with the audience, I, I studied them and, and tried to get a handle on the timing of their delivery of what they said, how they co how they took the audience on a on a journey somehow, you know. Mm. And uh, along the way, I think listening to good records, uh, listening to good players, and learning about songwriting arrangement and all that sort of stuff. The, that really, that, all that part of it was very important and still is. Mm -hmm. And it's still a craft that I work on, you know, um, uh, apart from my, my abilities, my skills and all that sort of stuff, I still work on my, my timing, my, my groove, uh, my sound, 
and and my writing. You know, I'm still learning. I don't think I've written my best stuff yet. Yeah. I'm still I'm still going at it. You know, yeah. uh, fluency is very important in your playing, um, not just from a musical perspective, but uh, I believe aesthetically, uh, you don't like the look of a clumsy oh. technique. No, exactly. Well, who, who wants to watch someone struggling with their instrument? You know, the moment you see someone struggling with their instrument, if they're on stage, it's like, go home and do some work, you know? <laughs> so, you know, when you walk out there to play, you better have it all together, yeah. you know? So if there are parts of it that, that really need work, then go home and do the work on it before you go out there, you know? Um, and that kind of stuff is important. Like, I remember the first time we, we saw Chet Atkins on the television, my mother said, he doesn't look like he's doing very much. No. It was because it looked so beautiful, you yeah. know? And it, what he was doing was really difficult. He just made it look beautiful, you know? Yeah. Um, Andy Allen has made some beautiful maiden guitars for you. No, I've got some of the best ones, I think. Yeah? <laughs> and what are the main elements that Andy has to get right for you? He has, to, he has to get the feeling and the sound. He has to get complex texture into, into my, my tone. There has to be an element of, of real traditional acoustic sound, and there has to be a definitely an element of playability. You know, I have to, I want to play this guitar and I, I want it to be so good that I don't want to put it down, yeah. you know? So uh, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for tone, looking for feeling, and uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not big on florally, fancy looking guitars. So I don't really care much for that. Um, and I would never buy a guitar because it looked beautiful, you know? It, it could be a crappy old thing and, and shoddy and have marks all over it, but if it, if it blows my dress up when I play it, then that's the one for me, yeah. you know? Because you, you quite often write all over your guitars. I, I used to. I went through a period. It was when I, I, I went through a divorce and my life went upside down and I just had to hang on to my music to survive. And, and one night at a, I was playing in a church in England and after the show, I got talking to the priest who was there and he opened a bottle of red wine back, back in, in the back area. And we had a couple of drinks and I, and I kind of poured my heart out to him. And that night, for some reason, I started writing on my guitar and I found it therapeutic. And so what I did is instead of writing my feelings, I wrote all the names of my heroes on my guitar so I could look at them when I looked down. And then I started writing messages. I, that, that's where the title Endless Road came from. I, I said to, to myself that night, well, the rest of my life has got to be an endless road. You know, I, I've got to get to work. I've been, you know, this, this, uh, um, abyss that I feel like I'm in because of uh, my, my divorce and, and the split in my family and all that. I can't let that kill me, you know? I can't let that drag me down and stop me. I've got to get going. So that's when I wrote the words, endless road, time to get going, you know? And then I wrote the song and all that. So writing on my guitar was therapeutic. You'll notice well, you haven't seen my guitars today, but I don't do that anymore because I don't need to anymore. I don't yeah. feel... It's, it's the same principle, if you will, as when Forrest Gump got up one day and, he, you know, um, his life had changed. He, uh, Jenny had, had left and he was on his own and he was confused. Mm. What, 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 what do I do? And he started running. You remember that? Yeah. And he ran until his beard grew like that. And then they said, are you running for this? Are you running for that? And da, da, da. And eventually he just stopped. And he just said, it's time to go home now. Yeah. That's what happened to me. Okay. Yeah. Um, we know a lot about your guitars. Uh, strings over the years. Uh -huh. What do you use now? And, and how much experimentation and exploration was there to well, arrive at that? I think I'm always anxious to try whatever the new string is, you know. Um, the strings that I favour these days, well, let, let, let me just uh, step, take one step back and say, the best strings are the ones that your guitar likes, not the one that you think is going to be the right one. What you've got to do is try different strings on your guitar. Find the ones that have the best sound, they have the, the beautiful overtones, that feel great, but most importantly, that tune up. 
They tune up so well, right? I find with my guitars, if I put Martin SP flexi-core strings on, it's just a dream. It's beautiful because they're, they're, they're a beautiful feeling string. Because they've got a flexi-cord, they, they feel a little softer, but when you bring them up to pitch, they, they, you still get a lot of pushback from them. And they've got that beautiful ringing like a, like a bottom end of a piano. There's a, those overtones. And that's what my ear is looking for. So Martin strings, Diodario strings are the most consistent string I've ever, ever heard. Um, and Ernie Ball uh, Everlast are the latest Ernie Ball string that I really like. Um, everything else I, I've tried, Elixirs and... Um, GHS and uh, DRs and all those, my guitars don't like them. Yeah. They, they just don't feel right. So you have to find what's right. Everybody has a right to you know, have their brand out there. But as far as I'm concerned, what works for me is Martin, mm -hmm. Diodario, and Ernie Ball, Everlast. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, to what extent do your guitars change with age and how do you notice? Oh, I noticed, uh, the thing that I noticed with the maintenance that I'm playing now, I got them last September, last August, September. All of them have, have just opened up. You know, they were good when, when I got them, mm. but it's like they just opened out, you know, particularly the cutaway that I'm using. That one has so much more complex uh, lows and mids and, and it's, because the highs were already there. That's the thing about Nathan, they've always had a sweet high end. Um, and what I was looking for was more, more woodiness, more, more depth, and that, that's what I've got now. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of guitarists I speak to uh, look to other instruments for their influence. Right. What can a guitar player learn from a sax player or a piano player? Oh, well, I, I learned so much from listening to other instruments, drummers, bass players, keyboard players, saxophone players. Okay, L listen to good saxophone players and listen to how they phrase, you know. They're not thinking like a guitar player. Mm. And what you've got to do, see, our fingers are like dogs. They go straight to the food bowl, don't they? You go, and people pick, like people are, we're, we're creatures of habit. So we pick up the guitar and we play the stuff we know. We play the stuff that sounds good and we know sounds nice, you know. That's the dogs going to the food bowl. So how do you break that cycle? Play things that you, you wouldn't normally play. Try to think about stuff, uh, about phrases and things, and then and, and play them. So um, I listen to piano players and try to emulate some of their runs and stuff. If you listen to Oscar Peterson, yeah, just listen to one of his songs. Don't even, just one. There's a lifetime of work in that one song when you listen to that guy. And, so, and that's how a guy like Lenny Bro ended up playing the way he played, because he studied Bill Evans' piano style and put it on the guitar. That's a great thing, yeah. you know. What I try to do when I'm playing, say if I'm playing duets with John Knowles or somebody like that, I try to think like the lead singer. So I don't want to be playing too much, just the melody and making it sing and let him do the chords underneath. When I'm playing one of my songs, like say for instance, uh, Stay Close to Me, one of those kind of ballads, I try to think like the singer and the piano player together right. on the guitar. So. Uh, last time I spoke to you, uh, we discussed uh, how you select songs mm -hmm. for your gigs. Um, I'm interested in the construction of your set. Mm -hmm. Do you think about uh, like, are there songs that you wouldn't begin the set with yeah. because you need to warm up a little bit? No, no, but um, I'm, I should be already warmed up by the time I get out there, shouldn't yeah. I? Yeah. Um, no, well, one of my biggest decisions is what do I start with because that dictates how the night takes off, yeah. right? And sometimes, uh, I mean, 20 years ago, I used to start with a really fast song and come out and hose the crap out of people. Because when you're trying to make a name for yourself in this business and you're trying to get people's attention and you're trying to build a crowd, you need to, to make a, a, a statement immediately. You know, it's like, holy smoke, who is this guy? You need to do that. 
Um, I'm not trying to do that as much these days because I'm, I'm trying to be more uh, selective with how I start and, and, and build, build the night, you know, because I've already got a room full of people and I'm grateful for that. So I don't need to hammer the hell out of them, you know. Uh, but I do like to do that from time to time. Yeah. Um, so my night should start out with something that I think every player should start with something that they feel really comfortable and confident that they're going to play a great groove with, with this tune and get people in straight away, you know. So, but what I do with my set is I try to build in the, the times, uh, surprises all the time, uh, where I'm going along, I'll, I'll break into a vocal tune, I'll, I'll take a solo, I'll, I'll play a drum solo thing, and then I'll go into another tune and, that, and I'll build it, and then I'll play something real slow, you know. And, and let it let it all settle, and then I'll come on a strong again. You know, a show should be like a meal. You know, starting out with your soup and salad, and then you got to get to the meat and potatoes. Now we're going to have some dessert, and now here's an espresso. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we spoke last time about the uh, album you're doing with other guitarists. Yeah. Uh, and you'd recorded something with Ricky Skaggs, Jason yeah. Isbell. I think yeah. you had David Grissom coming in to da do something. David Grisman and I, and uh, and then um, uh, uh, Brian Sutton came in. Yeah. And the three of us played as well. So when do you actually hope to have that completed? Uh, by the end of this year. Yeah. 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 It's a. Uh, I've had to do it like uh, when I come in off off tour. You know. Uh, and everybody's had to be available, so I, I had to really, it had to be well coordinated so I, I could get it done, you know. Yeah. Have you got a, a title? Not yet. Not yet. No, <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll come, yeah. yeah. I've also finished the album with John Knowles, uh, the love album, so okay. that's all love songs. Yeah. That's all done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this year, though, in November comes my next Christmas album, which is with John Knowles, Pat Bergeson and Annie Selleck. And uh, that's live in the studio. Okay. And that's called Christmas Memories. All right. So three albums in the not too distant future. Exactly. Yeah. And a live DVD. Um, we're, we're shooting the Christmas show this year, uh, December in California. Um, we'll we'll shoot two nights in Chico. Okay. And um, so and that'll come out next year as well. So no signs of slowing up at all. Time. Oh no. And there's th th there's a new True Fire instruction DVD out called a Fingerstyle Breakthroughs, and that has 11 songs and all instruction, yeah. six cameras and everything. It's beautiful. Yeah. Tommy Emanuel, it's been great to Thanks, chat. Thanks, Greg. Have yeah. a great gig tonight. Thanks, and happy Christmas to all you musicians and families and friends out there in Australia. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you. Cool. All right. That was great. Let's make a noise.